Hey, everybody. It's great to see you. My name is Jerry Herships. I'm the pastor at Applewood Valley United Methodist Church. And uh, I'm at the church right now recording. You can see that. But what I didn't know was that uh, apparently the air conditioning is not on in my office. So it's really, really hot here. Now, on a separate note, uh, I wanted you to uh, comment if you're watching this through Facebook in the comments below and let me know I'm taking a poll. If you like better me shooting these at home at my kitchen table or at work at my office, at my desk. So let me know. I can do it either place, but just trying to get a feel for uh, what you all are most comfortable with. So I'm going to sit here and sweat through this whole sermon. And uh, even though the topic is pretty heavy, if I'm sweating, it's just because of the temperature, not because of the topic. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that... Um, I've talked with every congregation I've ever served, and uh, it's pretty heavy stuff. So I'm going to read scripture first, and then I'll get right into it. And uh, know that uh, it may challenge some of your beliefs, and that's okay. Don't run away from that. So the passage we're going to read today is actually from uh, Luke 13. It's the first verse through the fifth verse, and it says this. At that very time... There were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, it is the number one thing that I get asked about, hands down, at every church I had ever served. And I will even take the risk and say it's probably the number one thing all clergy get asked about more than anything else. And it comes down to one word. Why? Why did my marriage fall apart? Why did I lose my job? Why did I get cancer? Why did that plane crash? Why is there war? Why are there mass shootings? Why do innocent people die? Usually the question behind the question is, where is God? Or how does God allow this? Or sometimes, is there a God? Maybe you've asked those same questions. I would add that not only is this the number one question asked to clergy, I believe it's always been the number one question asked by anybody throughout the ages. How do we justify the existence of God if there's so much hurt, pain, war, disease, and suffering in the world? Now, if I turned back the clock 19 years, I would find myself in seminary. In November 2004, my mom was dying. It was a combination of things, but we all knew that she didn't have much longer. I was in my first year of seminary at that time and had already signed up for my winter classes that started in January. One of the classes I signed up for months earlier, before any sickness with my mom, was a class called Death and Dying, Grieving and Loss. I kid you not. So by November, I was starting to second guess as to whether this was the best time for me to take such a class. So I found myself sitting in the last pew of the chapel at Isla School of Theology, chit-chatting with God. When in walks the professor who taught that class, who I had never met before. His name was Larry Graham. I introduced myself and said to him, so I'm scheduled to take your class, Death and Dying, Grieving and Loss, after the new year. My mom's in hospice and might not be around by the time I take your class. And I'm wondering if January would be a good time for me to take it. Larry smiled, a compassionate smile, and said to me, well, it'll either be the best time or the worst time. I knew we would be friends from that minute forward. Now, my mom did die soon after that on December 10th, 2004. A number of months later, I went and talked to Larry about it. After a while, because I kept thinking that by now I should, quote, be over it. And I'll never forget Larry's words. 
there is no timeline. There is no, I should be over this by now. He looked at me and said, Jerry, there's no right way to grieve. There's only your way to grieve. I have lost my mother, father, brother, mother-in-law, father-in-law, and my best friend. And I grieved every one of them different. Now, I could go into detail about the stages of grief when we encounter evil and suffering, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. That would give us more knowledge, you know, about grief. But I don't know if that answers the question of why there is evil and suffering in the first place. I first learned about theodicy in seminary. I was taking a class actually called theodicy, spelled T H E O. D-I-C-Y. Now, this is important because for the first week of the class, I thought we were going to study Homer's Odyssey. My bad. It was a 10-week class, and I think, honestly, it was the single most important class that I took at Island. I think it should be required for every person working towards a theology degree. And again, it was taught by Larry Graham, but this time it was co-taught by Carrie Doring. Now, Larry, sadly, just a few years ago, uh, himself died just uh, from cancer. Carrie, in the last five years, has lost her son suddenly. And a few years later, her husband suffered a sudden head injury and died a few hours later. Back then, they knew pain and suffering from the head and intellect. And later, they would also know it from their soul and their heart. Now, everybody goes through pain and suffering. You can't escape it. It's part of the human condition. When I was growing up, I would sometimes say to my dad one way or the other, why me? And my dad would always look at me and say, why not you? Nobody gets out of here without experience suffering and grief. Sadly, everybody gets their turn at it. But why? The study of evil and suffering is as old as time itself. The term theodicy was first used in 1710 in the writing of Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz, I think. But the study of it dates back to Augustine and even before that. I guess it's Augustine, my bad. Theodicy is to answer the question, why does God permit evil? That's the whole topic. Now, there's something called the inconsistency triad. It was developed by J.L. Mackey in 1955. It states that something in our thinking about God has to change. It's referred to as a trilemma. A trilemma is a difficult choice from three options. Mackey viewed it as three legs on a chair. One of these legs has to go away. So here are the three legs. Remember when I said earlier theology might be challenged? This is that time. The legs are these. God is all powerful. God is all loving. There is evil and suffering in the world. Now he breaks it down this way into the three theories. Theory one, there is no evil. You just think it's evil, but there's a bigger plan that you just don't understand. But God is all powerful and God is all loving. Theory two. There's evil in the world. God is all powerful, but God is not all loving. And theory three, there is evil in the world. God is all loving, but God is not all powerful. Greek philosopher Epicurus, he had thoughts about God that were similar, but they stated them a little bit different. It was summarized by a Scottish philosopher in the 1700s, David Hume. It goes like this. If God is unable to prevent evil, then God's not all-powerful. If God's not willing to prevent evil, then God's not all-good. If God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil exist? I want to pause here for a second. For many folks hearing this, this is a little mind-blowing because it demands us to think about our fundamental understanding of God in a different way. Now would be a good time to tell you where I might differ than other pastors you may know or have heard. 
It's simply this. I don't care if you agree with me. I don't. And what I mean by that, as John Wesley would say, we don't have to think alike to love alike. I have never believed that the preacher's job is to get you to think like me. What I do think the preacher's job is, is to share and present various understandings of God, share their own thoughts and their own understandings, and invite you, the listener, the viewer, into doing the hard work of discerning your understanding of God. That's our work as disciples. Now, I'll grant you, this is tough stuff. I'm guessing at least some of you are thinking, I thought he used to be a comic. This isn't funny. This isn't fun. It's not. It's heavy stuff. And we live in heavy times. We live in a time when there have been not one, but two mass shootings in a 24-hour period. Just this past July, July 22nd, we reached a grim milestone. We had had over 400 mass shootings so far in 2023. More than 400 by July 22nd. We live in a time where it seems that, honestly, some days the world is just coming undone. That's why we have to ask these hard questions, to try to make some sense, put it into a category in our lives that maybe we can understand. It's events like these that force us to directly confront the idea of God and how God exists in the face of evil and suffering. Now, it's important to note that a number of articles and stories back some strong data that suggests we are actually living in the safest time in history. If you want to read more about that, go to um, www.rworldindata.org. Nonetheless, when we come face to face with evil and suffering, it gives us pause, makes us ask hard questions. And I, for one, don't think that's really a bad thing. From her book, Walking Through the Darkness, Pastoral Care to Survivors of Traumatic Loss, Mary M. Price writes, Harold Kushner, who you've heard me mention before, was a rabbi who lost his young son to a rare disease. He wrote in his book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, God is the God of justice and not of power. And if we can open ourselves up to think of God differently, to acknowledge that God is not in control of all things, then many good things are possible. Kirshner builds the case for a God whose power is different, one that's rooted in love and compassion. This is why I personally fall on the third theory that Mackey stated above. I believe that yes, there is evil and suffering in the world. And yes, I believe that God is all loving. What I also have to believe to make sense of all the pain is that God is not all powerful. Now, do I believe that God is most powerful? Absolutely. But I below also believe in the concept of free will. I don't believe that this was all predestined. As a result, people can choose what to do with their thoughts and their words and their actions. It's in that gap that evil and suffering can enter in. This can be hard to process, and we all go about it in our own ways. This is why when we look at events of the world, we have to recognize that, that we all process things just a little bit differently. For some people, war is a trigger that spins them into grief, especially if that's a trigger from their own past memories. For others, it's HIV in Africa. For still others, it's mass shootings like, like the Walmart shooting in El Paso or the one in Dayton or the one in Boulder or or or. These events can produce a feeling of loss and, and helplessness, a feeling of wanting to throw up our hands and maybe say, what's the use? Or simply, why, God? In Elie Wiesel's landmark book, Night, he speaks of his experience of surviving the concentration camps during World War II. There was an especially painful moment where a child was hung for stealing bread. And the prisoners were forced to watch and at one point, someone simply said, where is God? And Vazel said he heard a voice inside him say, where is God? 
This is where, hanging here from the gallows. Now, Elie Wiesel never explained what the passage meant, and truly that's not the task of the author of literature. Interpretation lies in the hands of the reader. While I used to think, well, I used to think that Wiesel was saying that, that this was the death of God. There is no God. What God would allow this? God died in the gallows. Over time, though, I've changed my thinking. I now believe Wazell was making a different statement. I believe what he was trying to convey is that there is no darkness. God won't travel with us. There is no place God won't be present with us. Through our sickness, through our job losses, through our broken relationships, through war and injustice and mass shootings. Even in the gallows, God will not leave us, no matter what. Where is God? God was in the gallows, suffering right along with that child. Sometimes awful, awful things happen, and they are not the result of anything other than bad luck. That's what this passage is telling us. When Jesus in this passage speaks to the 18 killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, he's telling the crowd that there is nothing those 18 people did to, quote unquote, deserve that horrible death. Sometimes horrible things just happen. And they're not karma and they're not the result of past sins. This passage is telling us sometimes bad things happen for no reason. Now we all know this in our heads, and we know it with others, those people who were in El Paso, in that Walmart, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's all. Now, this is not to let the shooter off the hook, but it is a clarification that those victims did nothing wrong. Now, while we see that with others, sometimes we have a harder time seeing that with ourselves. We catch ourselves thinking, oh, if only I had. Oh, if only I didn't. That is a game of madness. And nobody wins. Sometimes, sometimes horrible shit just happens. And it's not the vengeful act of an angry God. So if we all grieve different, And know in our hearts and minds that sometimes bad things just happen. And we believe that God will never leave us to face our trials alone. And we're even okay with acknowledging God is not all powerful because he gave us free will. And as a result, sometimes people do horrible things. So if we buy all that, where's the hope? How do we move forward? You know, I I used to carry in my pocket a brass coin, and it had uh, an inscription on both sides. On one side, it said, memento more. And on the other side, it said, you could leave life right now. And while some may at first hear this and think, wow, monster Debbie Downer, Jerry, I see it different. I see it through the lens of what people in recovery would say, stay in your day. Don't get too wrapped up about what tomorrow will bring. We might never get there. Don't waste one second painfully reliving the past. It's over. It won't add one more minute to your life. Jesus told us this himself. Instead, memento more, realize that now, today, is all we have. We must live our lives completely and fully in the now because there are no guaranteed tomorrows. How do we process the war and pain and heartbreak and injustice and sorrows that we've seen in the past? Well, not by hashing it over and over, but by living our best lives now. Drink the good wine. Eat the ice cream. Call that old friend that you've been meaning to call. Not tomorrow, today. This moment is all we have. The only other thing I see in how we combat evil and suffering is to walk towards it when we see others going through it. 
This is what it truly means to be incarnation, incarnational, to be the incarnation of Christ. That is what it truly means to be incarnate, to be Christ in the world. When we see suffering in the world, the world's response is to run away. But that was never Jesus' response. Jesus ran towards the suffering and the pain of the world. And we can too. Call the lonely, feed the poor, comfort the sick. Hold the hand of your neighbor who's going through a hard time. This is the only way we can battle suffering truly. And the good news is, it has always worked. And it always will. Thanks be to God. Let it be so. Amen. So, some of your uh, some of your heads might be exploding. The idea of a, a not all powerful God. Last week I talked about a God that can change. Some of you were raised that God is unchanging. This week I'm telling you that God's not all powerful. If you were anything like me, you were brought up to believe that God's all loving and all powerful. But that's really hard to figure out how they coexist. I'm okay. I'm okay with having a God who's not all powerful. I'm not okay with having a God who's not all loving. You may be different. Like I said, I'm not here to convince you. I'm just, as they used to say on Dragnet, just here for the facts, man. Do some study. Do some prayer. Think, discern. See where you come out the other side. I hope you have a great week. I hope it's a little cooler where you are. I'm dying here. It's really, really hot in Denver. I hope where you're at, it's a little bit cooler. Although looking at the forecast, I think maybe not. Stay hydrated. Stay cool. Be cool. And I'll see you next week. See everybody.